They say that wrestling is cyclical. That means if you don't know that it runs in cycles, which is the main reason it's so cool when you're a kid. Innocence aside, when everything is brand new, it's all very exciting. This is not the case when you're a cynical 30 year old realizing the same stories and ideas continue to be copied and pasted after a certain amount of time. This is by choice though, we basically work history if you will. That is not always how it goes however, because from time to time the past straight up repeats itself by that amazing magic known as coincidence. Or aliens. It's one of the two and it's up to you to decide which is real. Failing that, all these probably happened because of ghosts. And you can't trust ghosts. Fact. I'm Simon from What Culture, and this is 10 Times Wrestling History Repeated Itself. Number 10, The Macho Man and the Spider. There's gonna be a lot of turning back the clock here, as you can imagine, but if we do return to the Macho Man's early days when he was just Randy Mario Poffo and playing baseball, his wrestling identity was simple. He was going to be the spider. Inspired by the comics he had read as a child, Randy thought it'd be a great idea in the world of sports entertainment and something that spoke to him on a personal level too ticked all those boxes. So isn't it weird that 30 years later when Sam Raimi was casting for the first Spider-Man film and needed someone to go, Bone Saw is ready, he would give the part to Mr. Savage. Especially as on the other side of the ring in that movie was Peter Parker, who wanted to be known as, that's right, the Human Spider. And that just take the biscuit, life straight up repeating itself. Whatever next. I'm an eye and losing an ear. You wouldn't think this is something that happened a lot, but that's wrestling for you. It's crazy, no matter what time period we're talking about. Let's switch the date to the 40s, 50s, and 60s and talk about Eric Holmbeck. Changing his name to Yukon Eric for some daft reason, his biggest claim to fame came in 1952 when one Vladek Kowalski screwed up a knee job and somehow severed Eric's ear. The incident gained so much traction it was why Kowalski added killer to the start of his name and it was a reputation that served him very well. He basically used it to climb the ladder and become someone most of us recognize today. Jump forward to 1994 and wouldn't you know it, at a show in Germany, Vader did the exact same thing to Mick Cactus Jack Foley after a botched hangman spot. Struggling to breathe in between the ropes, Foley realized he was just going to have to squeeze his way out of there and took his ear off in the process. Once again, it helped Vader no end as he capitalized on it, but whereas Holmback failed to do so, Mick made a career out of it, almost. It increased how tough people already thought Cactus Jack was and is a small reason as to why Foley is considered one of the best ever. Number 8, an undertaker and a badass biker. This one is ridiculous, but hey, what you gonna do? But yes, back in 2000, Mark Calloway repackaged his undertaker character as a badass biker that wore a bandana before a few years later transitioned back to the dead man that we've known since that day. However, if we go back to 1994, a real life friend of Taker's, Brian Lee, was brought into the WWE to play a fake version of The Undertaker so we could have that quirky Undertaker vs Undertaker match at SummerSlam 94. One of these was played by Callaway, the other one was played by Lee. They kind of looked a little bit like each other. That didn't last long, because of course it didn't. And it wasn't until three years later when Brian returned to the company as Chains, the dude who headed up DOA, a badass biker group. Once again, this wasn't long for this world, but considering Lee went from the phenom to a motorcyclist in three years, and The Undertaker then followed the exact same path, although be it over a much larger period, well, who could have called that? Basically, Lee stole Callaway's gimmick originally, so when it was time for a reshuffle, Callaway stole Lee's. Confused yet? Good. Number 7, The Next Generation Legacy. No one remembers this, or at least I don't, but while working for TNA in 2002, second generation wrestlers Brian Lawler, David Flair, and Eric Watts all teamed up together, mostly because they had famous dads. They played off this directly and called their stable Next Generation, so they were like a new version of the Xbox. The trio didn't do much and petered out by 2004, although they did have a somewhat high profile feud with Dusty Rhodes, mostly because it made sense. The history there was through the roof. Go to 2008, and W. WWE were doing the same thing. Realizing they had their own crop of second generation stars, Ted DiBiase, Harry Smith, Cody Rhodes, Manu and Sim Snooker were pegged together before management realized it needed a tweak. That meant getting rid of the latter two and Smith, bringing in Randy Orton for some star power and calling the now three man group Legacy. So exactly the same concept as what we just talked about. What's even stranger is that at this time Dusty Rhodes was feuding with Orton and you gotta think that ties in. Either way, Legacy did much better than their TNA counterparts and pretty much had a successful three year run. Number six, bad mouthing the commentator. Remember when Taz returned to WWE TV in 2000 as a heel and he was super pissed off at everyone? It's 
pretty good, right? He beat people up, didn't care who he upset, and took particular offense to what JR was saying about him on commentary. It was a good angle, as rarely did the words we were hearing at home tie into a wrestler's actions in the ring, and having Jerry the King Lawler stand up for Ross was just a nice way to build a feud. It worked, and it was different. Or was it? Way back in 1982 for Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling, Roddy Piper did something similar when Don Morocco, his former partner, had set his sights on announcer Gordon Soley. Much as the King did during his story, the idea here was to turn Piper face and it worked wonderfully well on both occasions. It was notorious bad guys stepping up to honor the legacy of the men behind the microphones to win favor with the audience, and you have to think someone with WWE had used this for inspiration. Given how well it worked, I think it's hard to argue it wasn't the right choice. Number 5. The Masked Doppelganger In 1982, All Japan Pro Wrestling brought in Mark Rodable Rocco from the UK to play the evil counterpart, the Tiger Mask. The story went the Black Tiger was a Yakuza hitman sent to get revenge on Tiger Mask for turning his back upon them and becoming noble. Yep, this was a real thing. Many people would play the parts of Tiger Mask and Black Tiger over the years to huge box office success, with the latter always being played by a foreigner. In 2011, WWE's attempts to get the original Sin Cara over would lead them to do something similar, or in this case, bring in Sin Cara Negro. The pair feuded to much less hoopla than what had happened in Japan, which was made worse when the internet got a hold of mistakes Sin Cara number one was making. He became a meme before you knew it. This eventually led to his sacking in 2013, allowing Sin Cara number two to don the mask for real, which he still does today. I think we don't see him much anymore. Number four, Vince McMahon and Territory Karma. In the early 1980s, shortly after purchasing the WWF from his dad, Vince McMahon began considering serious expansion that would require him to fly in the face of the territorial system that the NWA had going on in North America. Vince was out to take over everything. Much like anything of this ilk, it meant walking a road that was controversial to say the least, including airing his TV across all of America and hiring his competitors' best wrestlers so that he had the definitive brand. Then there was WrestleMania, which some say was inspired by the NWA's own Starcade of Event, and while the gamble on that first Mania show was very real, it basically cemented the WWE as the country's first national wrestling promotion as other companies were just grinded into the ground. In 1995, history popped up to return the favor. Eric Bischoff had just become the new boss at WC Derbia, and he knew to make a serious mark he'd have to go after the biggest game in town, much like McMahon had done years earlier. So Bischoff ripped up the rule book, took risks, signed his rival's talent away from him, and ruthlessly went head to head, which sparked the Monday Night Wars. The strange twist was that this was pretty much the exact same tactics McMahon had used a decade earlier, but with the advantage of Ted Turner fueling everything forward. In short, Eric tried his hardest to build up his company at the expense of McMahon's, a story that had already happened. Number three, Vince McMahon, Hulk Hogan, and Daniel Bryan. You're gonna think this is an odd call, but in many ways, the two men who went through very similar things when it came to dealing with pro wrestling are indeed Daniel Bryan and Hulk Hogan. Yep. It may have happened 31 years apart, but in 1982, when Hogan was working for the AWA, he struggled due to how the promotion saw the business. Owner Vern Gagne didn't care much for the showbiz side of wrestling, so when the Hulkster was making movies with Sylvester Stallone and slowly becoming a celebrity, it came back to bite him in the ass. The AWA wouldn't push him despite his popularity. While Vern realized that Hogan was money, he also believed that a good worker has to come first. Hulk would just have to be the proverbial underdog that would chase the title, but never get it. And what does that sound like? That's right, it sounds like Daniel Bryan circa 2013. Despite being over with the fans, great in the ring and having all the momentum in the world, Vince McMahon didn't see him as the guy, so decided it wouldn't happen. Bryan would still be used in high angle positions, but everything else was just out of reach. In this case, fans were so loud with their protest plans changed, which gave us that lovely moment at WrestleMania 30, but if Bryan and Hogan ever sit down for a coffee, they'll probably have some familiar stories. Number two, Vince McMahon and screw jobs. Vinny Mac is back, and this time we're talking about title belts and yes, screw jobs. We all know what happened in 1997 at the Survivor Series with Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels, but the real seed for all of this was planted two years prior when WWE Women's Champion Alondra Blaze jumped to WCW while still holding her title. Eric Bischoff convinced her to throw it in the bin, and that was it for McMahon. He vowed to never let another wrestler leave his company while they were still holding gold. 
The best part of this story is that Vince himself had done the exact same thing in 1991 when Ric Flair flew across to the WWE while still being World Championship Wrestling Champion. Jim Hurd had ridiculously let the Nature Boy go when he was still the man, allowing Vince and Flair to parade that title across WWE TV. Maybe it was this combined with what had happened with Blaze which led McMahon to believe there was no way the Hitman could be World Champion so close to leaving, and therefore the Montreal incident became one of the most talked about in wrestling history. Work though, didn't it? It spawned the Attitude Era and turned McMahon into one of the biggest heels ever. That success must have blinded him a touch because history repeated itself again when Jeff Jarrett held the WWE up for money as IC champ before heading to WCW. That is three for three. Number one, the Tombstone's Revenge. This one is a little harder to talk about, but facts are facts. We all remember Stone Cold Steve Austin and Owen Hart's Tombstone pile driver spot at SummerSlam 1997. It resulted in Austin breaking his neck and temporarily paralyzing him. It's as horrendous today as it was back then. Somehow Stone Cold was able to finish the match and overcome all of that to become one of the biggest stars ever. The incident took years off his career though, and he'd be forced to retire in 2003 with this accident being a huge reason for this. Rumors at the time suggested that Austin had asked Hart to drop to his knees instead of his ass, a suggestion that Owen dismissed as he believed he could perform it safely. There was a reason Stone Cold was worried though. Back in 1992, he'd been wrestling for New Japan as part of a WCW talent exchange. And while working with Masashira Chono, he'd run a very similar spot to this one where he sat down and broke Chono's neck. Five years later, the wheel would turn once more and it would be Austin on the receiving end. Creepy, but true.